Welcome, Peter Wilson, back to the AA. Uh, I think a lot of you might uh, remember an exhibition that Peter had here by now. I think it's about two years ago. It was in November of 1995. Um, and we showed uh, one of their uh, recently completed projects then, or it hadn't actually quite finished then. It was uh, this, the office building in Munster. And I think for this uh, exhibition, Peter sent us a series of uh, blueprints and some photographs and everything arrived in a shoebox. Um, and uh, it was a very easy exhibition to, uh, uh, to put up. It only took a couple of hours. Um, and it was a, it was a wonderful exhibition. Um, this was a very different uh, series of drawings to receive from uh, Peter because uh, all of us also know uh, the fantastic, beautiful drawings that uh, uh, Peter is uh, also very well known for uh, that uh, were done maybe 10 or 15 years ago when he was uh, a student here, when he had been teaching here and so on. And I think what was very important about uh, the way in which uh, he uh, had for the exhibition the, the working drawings, the blueprints that were shown was that really uh, this was also something very important in terms of putting the emphasis on the uh, fact of building and on the act of building itself that was an important part of uh, the project, the office building uh, in Munster. I think one of the things that characterizes the more recent work of the, of the practice is this uh, uh, very precise commitment to the uh, physical um, uh, specificity of the architectural project itself. But of course, uh, uh, we, uh, these, despite this these, uh, these, uh, emphasis, uh, it's, uh, we can't forget uh, the, the incredible uh, delicacy and beauty of the, of the other drawings that also always exist in the, in the kind of work that uh, uh, Peter and uh, Julia Bollis, his, uh, his partner, do, despite the fact that they, they do now don't have the, uh, the time to make those kinds of drawings and uh, are making different kinds of drawings. Uh, the, the, the practice uh, of um, Bollis Wilson has now been going for almost 10 years, and of course it was started after the successful uh, competition for the uh, Munster Library. Since then, the practice has uh, won many other comp competitions and projects in, in Germany, but more recently, uh, a number of major commissions of uh, various scales from urbanism to, uh, to uh, very small scale single buildings have happened, uh, not only in Germany, but in Holland. In addition to his practice, Peter has also been uh, teaching uh, at uh, a number of European universities, uh, more recently at the Weizensee in, in Berlin, and uh, right now he's a visiting professor at the Berlager. Uh, would you please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Peter Wilson. Thank you, Meissen. Um, it's very nice to be back at the AA. It always feels like um, the opening words of this lecture should be take off straight from where the last lecture ended. In fact, they will almost. Um, my lecture tonight will be consist in principle of uh, the recent work of our office, that is work from the last year or two years, fin mostly finished projects. Um, the title of the, le the lecture or the note in the events list about young architects, one knows architects suffer from the Paul McCartney syndrome, we are forever young. Um, we are still listed as a young and upcoming office in Germany. <laughs> I think when I reach the age of 50 I'm going to ask to come off these lists. We were listed last year at the Biennale in Venice as uh, or we were in, in the exhibition of Emerging Voices. Um, <laughs> we were also emerging in 1980 in, in Venice, so I'm not sure how long one could be emerging for. Um, the field of our operation is Europe. We are, we are based in Münster, small town provincial, very good for working. Um, those of you who follow the art scene will know the sculpture show in Münster this summer was a rival to the Castle Documenta. These sort of events happen sporadically on the European lands landscape, like, like, like these flashlights of one here, there and there. I think 
the idea of single cities containing all possible events is, is something which we simply, simply don't experience. The idea of landscape, or what, what one in German says, the, um, the European Landschaft, the, um, this idea of landscape almost taking over the function of city is an underlying theme to my lecture. This is not a theoretical proposition, it is more an observation. A second theme to the lecture will be to do with mass, or more, more specifically, mass in the age of media. I think simply, we, we must simply be very precise about what we mean when we say architecture today. I think the whole terms of operation have changed since the advent of electronic media. We have, as I said, we are, as I said, been based in Münster in Germany. We have been practicing there for 10 years. In this time, we've built nearly 20 buildings, starting with the, uh, the city library in Münster. The city library for us was the transition point from theory to practice. For us, it was like, it was like um, a revelation, one must say, that this is what all the rehearsal had been about. We, we are continually amazed to watch this building in operation. It has now been working or in operation for three years. It is the most successful public library in Germany. It has between four and 6,000 visitors every day, most of whom know absolutely nothing about architecture and don't go there to look at the architecture. And I think we must, as architects, keep this in mind, that our audience are not literate. They simply feel the building. And I hope that it is, it is a compliment to our building that, that they keep coming back and that the lending numbers keep sort of soaring beyond the wildest dreams of the librarians. I think this idea that architecture has a social responsibility, it is not a, 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 a game simply for architects, is also an underlying theme of my lecture. Um, maybe have this first slide, please. Two images, just one to reassure Moisson that we still do draw a notebook sketch. I think for us, we find the more we become involved in the actual conditions of production of buildings or production of cities, that the actual conditions are far more extraordinary, far more exciting than any scenario any architect can dream up. The sketch on the right is one where I was trying very badly, I think, and unreadably, to, put a, to make a diagram of a situation I read about in the newspaper in Germany. Simply, in Germany, as the, the telephone networks are deregulated, it means anybody can now supply um, digital information to offices, but this is ca digital information over cables. It turns out the only two institutions who are in a position to do that, this are one is the German railway company, the Bundesbahn, who have cable tracks beside every railway line, and the other is the electricity supply companies, who the, the top cable of, of the high tension wires is an information cable. So there are in place two existing networks all over the whole of the, the, whole of the European c continent. These different institutions are now waging a war to become the information or the, the rival information suppliers to, to the new high-tech zone of the Ruhr district or, or to any city, in fact. I think this idea that, that, that media wars are, are being carried on invisibly in, in the landscape that we all occupy is uh, quite extraordinary. It means that if one's a city planner, one simply must know where this information is going to come out of the cable. The second drawing is a workshop we have been, well, we are still working on in The Hague. You may recognize this fragment of Richard Meyer's town hall. We are becoming more involved um, in Holland, working in Holland. I think because in Holland one has a structure of planning where the planners, the planners plan. <laughs> Surprising as it may seem, there are urban planners who plan cities. In most cities, urban planners um, try to stop people doing a anything they might want to do. In Holland, the planners actually do, they project, they, they have ideas themselves, they also organize, in this case, a workshop, seven workshops, which each runs for 24 hours, working till to one or two in the morning with architects, investors, developers, people from the city, all sitting around the table designing a, a piece of the, of, of, of the Hague, a piece of the Hague equivalent to Oxford Street in, in London. It's not some peripheral zone. It's, it is the, very, the absolute center of the city. This is Rem Koolhaas's um, Suteran, um, two kilometers of underground tunnels um, sorting out the infrastructure of the city. Richard Meyer has provided the city with a new city hall. On one side is a building from Hermann Herzberger. Um, 
the workshop is with us and Meccano and some other very well-known Dutch architects. I think this idea of connectedness, of, that cities have a responsibility to um, reform, to remanifest themselves, is, is for us a very positive example for any, any other city. We are working here on this one, one block. So it's a very prosaic function, shopping center with 80 meter high office towers. Next two slides, please. This is where the le my last lecture left off. This, oh, I've got a pointer. This office building in Münster. Um, I'll describe it very briefly. I don't want to explain this building in detail tonight. Radial street leading to the city center, north-south railway line in Germany, a site which is basically a collision. The building influenced by the collision has waves in the facade. One sees here the negative plan form. This is our competition model, cast in lead. This is the mold we made it in, which we used to carry it later. The subject of this building is mass. It's, it's corporal integrity. We have, in all of our recent projects, tried to not to fragment, not to deconstruct. We are trying to, to hold our buildings together as single objects. These buildings are simply fragments in the rest of the city. They, there's no need them, for, them, for they themselves to fragment. The reason for, them, for this emphasis on mass, on, on volume, I'll move on to in a minute. Next two slides, please. The facade of that building, one sees here, the building starts very solid, very regular. It's a, a local government office building, very banal program again. Shops on the bottom cafeteria on the top, large flying roof. It starts here very regular and then flips slightly out of, out of uh, alignment with the street because of the, the influence of the railway line, leans on the corner. This lean is not, not simply a line drawn on paper. To make, to make a, the volume of a building lean is constructively a very um, difficult thing to do, something one should only do when one really knows how, or when, when one can make the construction also um, work with, with this particular slope. For this building, the important quality is the material it's made from. This, it's made from a brick, a green glazed brick, which costs about three Deutschmarks, about just over one pound for each brick. We told our clients here the luxury is simply in this quality of material, that if one makes the building from a decent material, the building will always be good. It doesn't have to be super fashionable. It doesn't have to have marble. Simply simply one, one good surface. This brick is glazed, which means when it's in shadow, it's absolutely black. And the, um, when the sun shines on it, it's, it's, it's very bright. It's, it's like a fish skin. It, it's almost a, a, re a recording, a reflecting of, of, of the different light conditions of, the co of its context. The curve on the outside is reflected in the inside organization. The front and the back facade are lined in offices. We, because of this curve, we get a very curious, very dynamic um, internal passage landscape. This is a straightforward office with offices lining both office doors on both sides of the passage. And here the service rooms in, 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 in the middle as an island. Next two slides, please. The reason I'm showing this project is this, this, this skin, this, this green, bluish green glazed brick. One sees here, to build this slope, we have stepped out each brick course one centimeter at a time. Quite geometrically quite simple, but it still took one very experienced bricklayer six months to, to, make, to make this corner of the wall. The wall starts straight and curves around to meet, to meet the slope here, which means that every brick course has it, it, its own geometry. Something one could probably draw in, in two or three minutes on a computer, but something which takes six months to make by hand. One sees here the, the two ends of the building where, with, with no office windows, and the, so where the mass of the building becomes evident. Next two slides, please. I want, would like to quote from an article in a, we're, um, our, there's a book of our recent projects being published in a few weeks' time. Um, in this, there's an article I've written called Mass in the Age of Media. These are two of our earlier projects where I think this, the, this relationship between media and architecture was, was the subject. 
One is the Center for, this one, the Center for Art and Media Technology in Karlsruhe. I'm sure you all know the first prize from Rem Koolhaas, the, the big cube which was not built. Ours was the second prize. Here we interpreted media, or the relationship between media and architecture as one, well, what the two have in common is interface. The interface for a building is its surface. Here the principal surface is the, the, the roof, a, a simulated landscape. The interface of, for media is of course the the screen of the monitor. It's, a, it's a, 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 an, an uncrossable interface. Here our folly from 1988 in Osaka, a small house for a computer, computer or for a, a video program. Here we separated the four video screens from the architecture. They are simply different things which have different time scales, different modes of presencing. Next slide please. In, this, in our, thesis, our thesis of ma mass in media is as follows. The current status of a work of architecture must be measured against the background of today's technological and perceptual possibilities. Electronically conveyed information, like Walter Benjamin's mechanical reproduction, reconstitutes not only the, visi the visible and the procedural, but also our relation to time and material. Today, the digital overshadows the topographical. The virtual depresences the physical. Besides the everyday revolutionizing of its production processes, there now seems for architecture, in the wake of media, the possibility to abandon troublesome materiality in favor of seductive but ultimately inaccessible virtuality. This option we reject. I think the first two schemes were about the possibility of a relationship between media and architecture. If one is talking about this relationship, one must perhaps look at what qualities do architecture and media have in common. They are both conveyors of information. On the subject of information, as carrier of information, post-Gutenberg, post-television, architecture has become a silent bystander. It is no longer read as a book. It cannot be beamed by satellite to any point on the globe. It simply cannot compete as information carrier with the phenomenal capacity of software. This is our kindergarten in Frankfurt from 19, 1992. At this time we were still concerned with the, the figurative in architecture, with the possibility of reading the facade of, of architecture. I think a very important um, theme in architecture, it always has been, um, we were early on much influenced by architecture parlante. For us, this, the possibilities of reading architecture are diminishing rapidly. Here we use a single letter, not even a sentence, not even a word, simply, um, simply a single letter, the sort of building block of, 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 of writing. The K is a, it's absolutely banal, K for kindergarten, but perhaps not. A kindergarten is a building where children themselves are learning to read. Perhaps at the same time they, that they see that they can read their building, they will grow up with a different understanding of architecture. On the other side, a recent competition, unsuccessful. Also the letter K turned on its back. Um, in German, K also stands for Kino, for cinema. It's turned out that the letter K was a very useful form for a, a cinema center. These are four, four cinemas packed into one tower. But here, the letter has become form, has become mass. It was a single, a single volume, not text on the surface, but the, the volume itself. Um, what else does architecture and media have in common? Duration. The qualities of architecture... Ah, I missed my point here. Other than information, the qualities of architecture lie elsewhere. Its duration, its concrete and haptic presence, its framing of everyday life. In terms of duration, media is instantaneous. instantaneous. Buildings, on the other hand, after their protracted and laborious incubation, stay. We get to know them slowly through the habits of use. In their staying, building become their play. buildings become their place, their site. Such singular locations are as unrepeatable as teletransported information is ubiquitous and simultaneous. 
What else does architectural media have in common? Measure. Architecture give, gives measure to its immediate context. Another reason for such monumental forms entering our language is that I think architecture has a responsibility today to give, a, to give measure to the otherwise dimensionless um, peripheral fields of, of our cities. Architecture gives measure to its immediate context, to the comings and goings of daily use. It can never be totally disconnected from the scale, the imprint of the human body. The dizzying fractal permutations of media nets and other, on the other hand, result in the, in the non-depth, the equal near, nearness, the blandness of 24-hour news. Such a depth seems also to char characterize our infinitely permeable and infinitely forgettable post-urban settlement patterns. And finally, one comes to the quality which I think distinguishes architecture completely or totally from, from media, and that is mass. Ultimately, it is mass. Oh, can we have the next two slides, please? Ultimately, it is mass which most distinguishes architecture from the fleeting images of electronic media. To exemplify mass leads towards an Eduardo chilida like form language. This is a sculpture from Chilida, of course. A solid, homogeneous volume modulated within the, within the material limits of its corporal integrity. In today's carpet-like urban field, architecture can no longer hope to order the whole. Instead, by focusing on its unambiguous presence, on its mass, it has the possibility to hold fast, to anchor, to give measure to the surrounding flux. This is what we call the iceberg strategy, mass in the age of media. I think we're talking here about a very different sort of mass to a traditional mass, the, the mass of the classical building, the mass of the stones of a Greek temple. Next slide, please. The mass of a contemporary building is an implied mass, not a literal mass. For, for us, these cooling towers are a very good example for architecture today. This one knows, uh, these are, this is an artwork from Bernd and Hiller Becker. These cooling towers are massive. They are icebergs in the, in the in industrial landscape. They are at the same time completely hollow, completely empty. Their function is to facilitate the, f the, the rapid flowing of air through them. For us, they are analogous to buildings like this. This is the technology center we have built on the periphery of Münster. Also an iceberg, a building which we concentrated to the maximum degree, made as high as possible. It has no direct contextual relationships. And yet, simply by its presence, it gives order to the discoherent, dissipated field it's, it stands in. It is also a thin skin building, like these, like these towers. Um, aluminium, metal pla cladding, precast concrete panels. I think we are predestined to work with such construction techniques. One has to find a way to integrate them into one's theoretical framework. Next slide, please. This interest in mass has led us to, to simplify many of our recent projects. Um, Many of our recent projects are simplified simply because of, their, of economic restraints at the same time. We are, these are ex sometimes expedients. We are, very, we are purposely very pragmatic about the actual conditions of building. This is a project in Holland. In Holland, they build a lot, very good architecture on unbelievably low budgets. This is a school building we worked on in conjunction with the Dutch office of Kreischer Elfers. Um, well, we, we will see in a minute the, the con context, the situation. It, it is part of the Kop van Sao, the um, dockland area of, of Rotterdam. One sees here the form language which we ref we re I referred to before as sort of Eduardo Chilida like clearly carved objects. Next two slides, please. The design model on this side, one sees here the building, is a, it is a wedge-shaped site. The site determines the building form. Um, at the head of the site, we place the tower. In fact, there are two functions here. One is a medical training school, and one is a, um, um, a sort of job training center. We place a large mass at the head. This is the, the sort of ending of, a, of a, sort of a dynamic urban street pattern. Simply by 
understanding the geometry of the site and leaning these two edges, we, we create a very curious um, um, fork-like facade, the one we saw in the two previous slides. The tower itself, um, a single sculpted volume. Next slide, please. The building from the side, one sees it's a single mass. It has a base which sits on the ground, which wraps around and becomes a tower. This is the sort of the, the head, the sort of sphinx-like head of the building. Behind the building, on, on this end, is, is, a, is a housing district. This is actually, from the planning model, this is the position of our building in relation to the new harbour district in Rotterdam. It is the last building, the southernmost building of the new planning district. I don't want to say very much about this building in detail, um, more to use it as an il illustration of this concept of corporal integrity. I would like them maybe to go on to talk about other projects we've done in the Kop van Saud. This is from the official, one of the official planning documents, I think a very early document now from 1990. The Kop van Saud is a Dockland zone, um, unlike that in London, a Dockland zone which is planned, um, which looks like being very successful, which is becoming one of the most quoted planning models in Europe. Not only is, is the is the, the physical structure here planned, but also the planning procedure which, which controls it has, was designed by the, head of the, the then head of the planning office, a very important person, Rick, Rick Bakker, her name is. She developed something called the quality team, which sounds like a chocolate box, but in fact um, is a team who have ab ab the absolute right to say yes or no, that building gets built, that building doesn't. Um, they, they make this decision on urban planning grounds or, e or on aesthetic grounds. For example, this tower at the end here is being planned by Norman Foster. And when Norman Foster presented his scheme, the quality team said, not good enough, Norman, try again. <laughs> <laughs> and he swallowed and said, all right, I will. And his, his second scheme was also rejected. He's now, now working on the third, or I think the third has been accepted. I think this idea of planning authority is something just simply unheard of in England. We luckily have, well, we have more luck with the quality team. We, they actually gave us this job to, to sort it out. Um, the architects who were working on it were not getting it together. We have also, we started working on a scheme on the water, water edge here, which I'll show in a minute. You all, I'm sure, know Ben Van Berkel's bridge here. Next, the next slide, please. This is a plan, this is the city centre here, Ben's Bridge, the Wilhelmina Pier, housing zones here, the school I showed here at the end. The view to the waterfront here is what one sees here, this is the, the Ben's Bridge again. Our first project here was this, this key, this waterfront landscape. We have, we have, this is the Foster Tower here, this is a tower by the piano is currently working on, and behind that is our Luxor Theatre, this red blob I'll show in a minute. We have also worked on the landscaping of this pier at the end here. This is the Hotel New York, a very um, important building in Rotterdam. Our function, or the, our role here with this very first key, is to plan a building which brings the scale down from the sort of the, the super scale of, of business towers down to the scale of the human being, the, the, the pedestrian. This public space is basically a traffic space to get to the bridge, but the key is meant to be a a space, a place where one, where one sits, where one looks and watches, watches the incredible um, choreography of ships on the River Mass. Next slide, please. The situation here, um, I like very much this slide, this sort of, one sees senses here, this sort of pioneering atmosphere, this sort of new, almost new, new world or new landscape. In fact, all landscapes in Holland are new. The Dutch say God made the world, but the Dutch made Holland. <laughs> um, our site, we, we actually designed our, or made our site before we, before we, we put the buildings on it. The, the whole site is actually a, a table standing on legs in, 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 in the water. It's, 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 it's simply a matter of pra pragmatics. It's, it's cheaper to do that than, than to build a proper dike. Um, this is our Luxor Theatre, which I will explain in a minute. First, the landscaping on the water's edge. The landscaping is basically this ground surface. The question is, we had to step down one and a half meters from the bridge 
we've done a stri we, had to, we made a striped ramp here which f then folds into the water. This fold again is architectonic but also pragmatic. Underneath here in this direction runs a subway line. We had to reinforce this edge of the pier which, with, a, with a different constructional system. So we had in any case a different type of, or different type of structure which gave us a, an, an ending for our, our ramp. On this end, a building, this one here, it's a building to do with the harbour. It's a bridge controller's house or bridge watcher's house. On the other end, a very small um, signal in a way, a building signalling the coming activity of the harbour. And in, in, in the middle, a colonnade, this stripe here, which, which provides a separation, a spatial separation from the traffic and the, and the more quieter river edge, but, but without blo um, making a visual separation from, from the buildings behind to the, to the river. This is a future restaurant. The next two slides. One sees here the construction, the, this table standing on legs, um, the subway line underneath here, steel, steel structure here, this colonnade. It's possible to walk up one end along and down the other end. Here the bridge watcher's house under construction. This is the Hef Bridge, a famous lifting bridge in Rotterdam, one of the monuments of of the um, start of this century. This is the key at night time. We have here things we call electronic rocks. They're sort of blobs of concrete. They look like the last car uh, cargo unloaded from a ship. Um, they're street furniture with no precise function. Here one sees the, sort of the, the, the rock maker or the blob maker with his blob making machine. Um, the whole site is, is filled with sand, leveled with sand. Um, the Dutch like building on sand because it sinks. It means they can re remake it every five years, which is something they like to do. Next slide, please. From the design model, one sees from, th from the land side, again, the colonnade, staircase up, walk along, staircase down, future restaurant, canopy roof at this end. And on the edge, the bridge watcher's house. It was originally planned to have a red wall to the back. The red wall is now yellow because magnesium is a, an unstable material. One can't actually glaze red bricks, we found out later. The point here again, I think, is this, this idea of mass, of this, this curious volume, this, this totem almost standing in the harbor. It looks, it looks like it's almost it's integral with, with the ground surface, but all, all of which we know are, are, are construction and, 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 and not solid. Next slide. It has three entirely different faces. Depending on which side one, 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 one approaches it from, one thinks it almost a different building. The yellow facade to the south, one, one, one drives actually on this, um, um, towards this facade, um, driving, driving to cross the bridge. The white facade is the, the formal facade, the, almost like a Villa Savoy on legs, a Daddy Long Legs Villa Savoy. The bridge watchers have to be at a height of, of 12 meters to watch the shipping, but in fact they sit with their backs to the window and watch the shipping on their radar screens. This is a radar area, uh, antenna on top. Our structure, we have um, a grid of columns holding up our key, this, these are the only points we, we, we can place columns. So the whole, the whole structure is, is, determined, is predetermined by this, the, the, the larger structural system of the key. Um, a lift access, fire escape on the outside to keep this, this column as thin as possible. Again, this, this language of mass, this of almost a single carved object. Here we have um, white metal panels, this is a glazed brick. The black elements are um, corrugated metal. Next slide, please. Depending on one's viewpoint, this is either a static or a very dynamic object seen from the corner, or, or whenever one sees two sides together, it sort of leaps to life. The black one reads, of course, as a, as a cutout. One sees here the geometry, I think. Underlying any mass, any form, is geometry. I think geometry is the sort of basis of architecture, even if the modes and permutations of our geometry change according to the tools we use. It is always there is always a geometric rigor necessary in architecture. One sees here the curious section um, at the point, 
um, entirely designed by the structural engineer, the, the two loading points. And we need two, two, two triangles to be stable. The radar column directly on top here, section through the staircase, elevations. Next slide, please. We like to think of so, or see that such a building as maybe in a very long-term series of buildings we've, or type of design we've worked on. The house for something or other, the house for the um, water house, perhaps. This theory of, this idea of that the house, is a, the house is a character in itself has run through our research ever since the earliest days at the AA or even our follies in Japan. I think it, we're very pleased that our first building in Holland is also a house for somebody. Uh, even if it is a public house. At the foot of the bridge watcher's house, on the paving, we have something we call the garden of fixed numbers, simply numbers in the paving pattern. These are actually a standard product in Holland, numbers which are put next to fire hydrants or house numbers. Um, we have put them together in a matrix. It is, in fact, a medieval number puzzle. If one adds up the numbers in any direction, the answer is always 15. I think this, I think number like geometry sort of runs through any science. Um, Francis Yates pointed out beautifully that the, the number was, was the key to all the Vitruvian subjects. Um, something, um, I think number is fun, simply fundamental to, 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 to knowledge. Today we have a whole different new technology of numbers, the digital technology, um, zero, one, zero, one. We have here our Fixed, garden of fixed numbers, at the other end of our key, a tower of moving numbers, a, a, of digital numbers. Um, in a way, our, the bridge, the colonnade, one sees here in the middle, is a, an oscillation, a, sort of a, almost a, a route between these two extremes, between fixedness and dynamism. This is our, our little, our, our second little tower. Um, one sees it here in the urban context of this whole urban choreography, the, the, the dynamism of the city, this, the city of light. Next slides, please. <coughs> the same contrast of the fixed, fixed object mass, um, the digital technology movement. This is a tower with five different number boxes with um, LED displays, display systems, very everyday technology of what one sees with time or weather on any number of buildings. One sees it here taking its place um, in the harbor landscape. This is a, a Russian, Russian tugboat that happened to be anchored there. Here the number, um, what one doesn't see on slides of course is that the numbers move. The car's moving as well. Next slide please. Here we reduce the structure to a minimum, simply a pin and also a cage. The numbers are rather like budgerigars in a cage. Um, the cage is, um, I'm not, not quite sure what the system is called. It's, it's something which, um, I can't even remember, re remember which one of the Russian constructivists did it, built or designed a tower like that. Simply an, a network of wires. Here we've, we've, we've actually done a, a tension structure, not a compression structure, with a hanging concrete ring at the bottom holding the cage in place. Inside the cage, the five different number elements. Here again, the geometry of, of the tower, a triangular bracing leg here. <coughs> Next slide, please. The point of the tower is, of course, at nighttime when the architecture disappears and one has this sort of Bur these are burning red numbers seen across the city. One of them is temperature. Of course, one must have to, has to have the temperature. One of them is time. One of them is a cube of random numbers, which we don't see here. One of them is a zero, like a heartbeat, which is sort of on, off, on, off. In fact, it's been, it's been programmed to much, too, much too slow. We intended it to beat much faster. So I think this, it, this probably means the tower is in, is in a critical state. Um, and the upper number is the world population, which means it's a, a very long number, which is always changing at the bottom. It's, and once one knows that, it's terrifying to stand in front. In fact, this bottom number changes by threes. It's digitally not possible for it to change as, as fast as babies are being born, which is a really <laughs> frightening concept. It sort of glows at one end like a cigarette. 
the temperature rotates. One sees here, this is a warm, a warm day when they planned it and a cold day when I photographed it. Next slide, please. And between these two, the colonnade. Here one sees somebody walking down the colonnade. I think this idea of a building is both a frame, um, something which gives measure, as I said before, one of architecture's principal functions. This measures the view from the, from the new docklands to the city. But of course, once one, one, one is on it, once one is inside the architecture, one is part of the measuring machine. One sees here, here people standing on top, who are almost, almost like sort of looking over the parapet of a, of, of a classical building. Um, curiously, once one is on top, between, um, stand, uh, it looks here as if one is in a very vulnerable, vulnerable position, one is on stage. But in fact, when one stands on top, one is between these two massive steel beams, which means one is very protected, one feels very secure. Um, this is the, the way down at the other end. This piece will connect to a future restaurant here, so one will be able to walk from the intermediate balcony to the um, terrace of the restaurant, the moment one walks down this way. Curiously, it's been very, this beam has been very successful, not planned, but all the um, spray painters in Rotterdam paint on the inside and not the outside because they're, they're, they're unseen. So we have something like a graffiti gallery on the inside and a nice, neat building on the outside. <laughs> Our canopy roof is not, I think, is more to mark this corner, this sort of landing point of the bridge. Rotterdam is enormously windy, and if it rains, you have to stand here to keep dry. Next slide, please. This is the colonnade under construction. I think, again, the construction of a building, this actual process of becoming, is, is, one, of the, is one of the most exciting, most dy dy dynamic and sort of uh, magical things. This is um, standing on top of this, this colonnade here. One, here, one finds that the, the, the beam itself acts as a fault or as a horizon, as a sort of measuring point for a 360 degree landscape. Very, very curious sort of optical. Um, effect. Next two slides, please. So this is um, our, color, our, our key, our landscaping in, 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 on the water's edge. After having worked on this landscaping, we, we did a workshop with the city planning office for the choreography of the whole square, which included actually end, um, how this zone should end. The master plan for this whole zone it was from the Foster's office planned rather like when we plan an air conditioning system, um, very pragmatically but with very little <laughs> urban quality. <laughs> it didn't end very well at all, so we were brought in to straighten out the, the end here. We, 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 we simply cut it off, so cutting off Norman. <laughs> and we, we developed the concept of, of this, building, this hinge building here, this sort of um, pivot point between the Wilhelmina Pier, the office zone, and these other institutions. This is a tax office, a law court, and an office building. And this is a building which belongs to, to, to neither precinct, but, but stands sort of as, a, as, an, as an anchor point or as a, as a pivot point between. Subsequently, this was the subject of a limited competition, five Dutch architects plus our own office from Germany. Uh, this is Rem Kuhlhaus and Hermann Herzberg and Case Christians and other architects. Um, we, we won the competition, and we are now um, busily working towards the start of construction in, in May next year. I think we had an unfair advantage in the competition because this form had already been built into the master plan of the city. All the other architects broke the site limits and extended across the water, which we knew was simply not possible. There were, there were site lines which had to be observed. We took it upon ourselves to to put the theatre program within this given blob form. We, we called it the blob. Um, very difficult as the theatre program is, is very big and has very, very precise requirements such as um, delivery from three 18 metre long delivery trucks on the, um, at first floor level. It was one of the urban planning requirements that the stage level be at first floor so the ground plane opens itself out more to the, to the st at street level. To get three 80 meter long trucks to first floor level, one needs a 50 meter long ramp. Almost impossible on this site. But we set ourselves the task of, of doing, doing all of that within the blob. Next slide, please. First of all, from some of our competition planning models, of so form study models. Here we, we, we took our given blob and started 
putting in the, the theater program, one sees immediately a flight tower emerging from the top of it, um, a language of, of arms, of projections. It turned out the truck ramp does not entirely fit in the building. It, it has to, one, the trucks have to at one point drive out the back of the building um, in a projection over the harbor and, and then back, back in to unload beside the stage. Next slide, please. We finally, or our, our design in the end turned out to be simply um, a matter of adding up the givens. A truck ramp for trucks to drive up here and then back into a loading bay, <coughs> a given, given dimensions of flight tower and auditorium, and the given outer, or the maximum outer perimeter of the blob. So A plus B into C gives you your theatre. Um, architecture becomes very easy. <laughs> we call it close packing. Um, so the, the whole theme of the building then becomes this, 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 this ramp. The ramp, the truck ramp becomes a, a volume. It, it also has a, a roof which presences inter, inside the foyer of the theatre. This is a sketch of the public routing, this sort of architecture, um, architectural promenade, sort of around the outside of the auditorium on, on, on top of the, the truck ramp. So the, the, the truck ramp basically designs the inside of the theatre. The red is the auditorium which it ends up that the, the blob becomes a spiral. One single wall wraps around, around the outside and then, um, I think we'll see that in the next slide. Next slide, please. Yes, one sees here in the plan. The truck ramp is underneath. Trucks drive in here, drive out here, and back in there. Three trucks park beside, beside each other and unload onto the stage. There's only one place where trucks can enter so we have to place our building on the site with the backstage to the front with an entrance here at the corner and the public move in a spiral m motion around the auditorium filtering in at various points. Um, basically all of these, th this was simply a matter of, of working the program very closely out with, with the context. We have a given stage side, size, given auditorium with three balconies one sees here in this, in this section backstage lined up to the front. I think backstage belongs at the front of a theatre. The backstage is the part of the building used during the day where there is a, an internal life which also connects to the life of the street. Two, um, two main foyer zones, one at the north with views to the city and one at the south with views to, to the, to the harbour to the south. There's water on both sides of this building. Um, a large, large window to the south. The roof of the ramp here becomes an outside terrace. Here, larger foyer bars, bar spaces. A theatre is a fantastic program to work on. One simply has a has scale dimensions, which which exist, or, or scale changes, which exist in no other building. Here, the backstage changing rooms, and suddenly here, a sort of 35, 40 meter high void, the the fly tower, with the the grid on top for for, for moving all the the, the props. Technically, as well, the, the whole theatre is a is itself a musical instrument. This is a theatre for popular musicals, shows like Cats and <laughs> Joe, um, but also a theatre which, which, which has to work for operas. So operas have a totally different re re reverberation time to, 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 to musicals, which are nearly all recorded music. This means we have to be able to change the reverberation time of our, of our auditorium by lowering the ceiling. We have here lowering low, uh, ceiling panels which can be lowered to this height which is simply the building is like a bellows. It, 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 it simply can, can be, be, be altered for, to achieve the required acoustics. Next slides, please. Um, this is how it will look. This is a sketch just to, to show to Moisson that we still do draw. We occasionally find time. Um, this is a sketch called The, the Opening Night. Um, of course, lots of light, lots, enormous numbers of people. <laughs> it's, it's a theatre for an audience of 1,500. One sees here this, the spiral in the plan, so visible on the outside. The spiral is, is, has a, a red colour. It's actually called tomato red, which the, the Dutch like, because they, they grow lots of tomatoes in their greenhouses. They, they, they don't like being told that their greenhouse tomatoes have no taste, but <laughs> still. Um, yeah, this building spiral, the fly tower as sort of ad advertising surface. And the, ent the actual entrance here has the full height of the fly tower, so the, the, the public when entering sort of are almost on stage themselves. 
we took particular care to, uh, to, to place the entrance actually in an extension of the line of the proscenium. The proscenium, as one knows, is this borderline between the world of the audience and the world of the stage, the world of fantasy. I think this sort of, it's rather like the interface of a computer. It, it is, it is um, two worlds rubbing, rubbing up against each other. Much as the door of a theatre should be, as one enters the theatre, one enters, one, one, one leaves the, the space of the city and enters the house of illusion. So we, we took particular care to, to take this one line right through the whole building. Next slide, please. This particular piece of Rotterdam has become almost like a Bollis Wilson playground. This is another project of ours on the Wilhelmina Pier. A very small project. Here we're um, landscaping and, and a second key. The other, one, the other key we saw is a bit to the left here. Foster is building here, here his tower, which is the um, harbor company of Rotterdam headquarters. This key is very sig a very, has a very significant or great significance in the history of Rotterdam. This is the departure point for immigrants to Europe in sort of pre- and post-war times. This is the sort of the last of Europe. Um, the, the shipping company was called the Holland America Shipping Line. I think a point of great nostalgia in a way, the, sort of the, the last of the old world. Sort of, one almost imagines standing on the edge here, being able to see a sort of uh, um, uh, the skyline of New York or sort of the Statue of Liberty. It is, there is a sort of a, a direct connection. These ships do sail off and sort of um, sail off to, to, or did sail off to America. Now the shipping has all left. There, are, there is no more mass immigration. Only cruise ships stop here. One has to somehow reinvent this landscape. We were asked very, to do a very quick, quick study on what shape should this pier have. It, it actually had to be constructed in, in a, a, a month or two later. We said simply cut off the edge square. It, it is a, a horizon, an end point, the last of Europe. The horizon should be like a, a, a Steinberg painting with, with, with a sort of New York in the distance. But then we said as a planning concept, not, we not, not, not only have one horizon here, but perhaps also a border. We said we invented here a conceptual Holland-America border. We, sh we, we, we slipped the border perhaps a few meters closer to Holland. We gave a piece of Holland to America. So in fact now if we designate this as American space, and when one says American space, one thinks perhaps of the cover of Baudrillard's book called America, a picture of the Nevada desert with, with caravans, a, a, space where, a space of impermanence, or a, a, almost a, a nomadic space. We said this is a space of impermanence, where there should be no fixed structures. The people who run the Hotel New York put on a lot of events, um, sort of theater shows, all sort of children's theaters. Um, they're very, just very good at sort of creating um, urban life. They wanted a, a theater, or no, they wanted a field for these events. So we, we said, okay, here is our events field. But th these are all um, provisional activities. They're, 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 they're not fixed, they're not permanent. So this space we hope will, will be paved with, um, we would like it in Corten steel, but I think it will probably be simply concrete panels. It's possible to drive across the border into America and out of America, sort of cruising into America. <laughs> Um, one could even charge money at the border or check passports. Along the Holland America, or on the other side of the Holland America border, um, we have an artificial hill. Um, of course, the whole of Holland is an artificial hill, an artificial landscape. Um, this hill is a future underground car park. This site has to be kept, kept clear, but we, we, to reserve it, we, we actually make it a little bit higher than, than, than the rest of the quay. It will have grass on it and act sometimes as a as a, um, a sort of a sitting place for theatre shows here. There's also a very small playground placed exactly on the border, so it's possible for children on a swing to swing in and out of America. There is a cafe terrace for the hotel with a, an H for Holland and an A for America. The, the cafe tables are only in Holland. The America side will be, hopefully we'll f we can flood it and freeze it in winter and, and have a skating ring there little bandstand half right on the border. Um, this is a very sort of quick planning exercise. Um, it's not, not yet realized. Next slide, please.
I'd like now to come to the second principal subject of my lecture, which is the Euro-Landschaft, Euro the, the Euro-Landscape. I think it's a, it's a theme which we have come to more by accident, simply because we, we find ourselves traversing a type of landscape which our theories of planning simply cannot describe, don't fit. If one uses the concept of city, the city as a mono or as a, as a, as a centered, focused organism which has a, perhaps a periphery and then an outside which is green nature. One simply cannot use this model to describe a condition like this. This is the Ruhr district of Germany where six, ten, I'm not sure how many cities have grown together. It is simply a carpet landscape where city is, is a condition, not a place, where one finds sometimes functioning industry, sometimes abandoned industry, sometimes beautiful areas of green nature, sometimes expensive residential districts, sometimes very um, impoverished residential districts, all sort of cut and folded together as if, as if by some sort of maniac tapestry maker. I think, I think our studies in Tokyo helped us to understand this. Tokyo we once described as being like a hologram plate. If you break a hologram plate, you find the complete image in every fragment. It, 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 it has a sort of a code, a formula. It is, it is oh, Roland Barthes once described um, Tokyo very beautifully as, as the city without a center, but I think it, Tokyo is, 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 is even more extreme than that. Every time one comes up from the subway in Tokyo, it's exactly the same. There's, there's the same taller buildings, the same smaller buildings, the same density of people. Our analysis of the Euro landscape is that it is like Tokyo, but maybe 10, maybe 50 times less dense. It's almost from the Mediterranean to the North Sea. It, it functions as one urbanized network. Maybe I could quote again from our forthcoming book here. At the end of the 20th century, the habitation pattern of Europe is best understood from an aeroplane at night, an almost ubiquitous net of transport routes scattered industrial, residential and leisure fields. The, the historic city is just one of many nodes. There is no longer an inside and an outside, only local borders between differing textual conditions. One sees this absolutely in the map of the Ruhr. We spent quite a lot of time in the last few years trying to map this condition, not in terms of conventional plans, but more in terms of cognitive maps or sort of curious diagrams like this, sort of trying to find perhaps the um, thematic template of such ordering systems. I think we are, or I, our, our office is making a few tentative steps, steps in this direction. In Holland, for example, there's much more, the, the, the understanding of this landscape is much more advanced. I'm thinking here perhaps of um, the, the carpet landscape theory of Willem Jan Neuterlings. Um, to quote again, today's increasingly dispersed urban landscape is a result of technological evolution. Invisible information, media and communication techniques do away with the need for physical proximity. Ubiquitous infrastructural networks and freeway grids allow easy individual or containerized access to almost any point on the map. Simply, our technologies no longer require focusing. The 19th century city um, was basically a consequence of the transport system of its time, the railway, the railway focuses. The 19th century city was the display of the wealth of industry, which was elsewhere. But, it was t but I think the, the important factor is the transport network. One finds in Europe now the, the autobahn system, the, the freeway system is so ubiquitous <coughs> that, for, that one, one has known for a long time that uh, about out-of-town out shopping centers. One finds in Germany now a whole new generation of out-of-town theaters, which means sort of the Andrew Lloyd Webber shows when they open in Germany don't open in a city. They open next to a freeway junction where, where they have the maximum catchment area. A whole other way of the landscape evolving. I think we as architects simply must open our eyes and ob observe these conditions. These conditions are for me ten times more exciting than any theory we, we can invent as architects and they are actually there. They are miles ahead of any of our thinking. To quote it further, visual coherence is absent in this new dispersed city. This does not mean that it is random. It belongs to a high, higher order of complexity and must be understood within the framework of mobility. Time has substituted physical distance 
as that which joins or separates. New, loose and a new loose and unstable geography that sidesteps planning and traditional urban ad administration. I think the key word here is perhaps it, it's the digital landscape. The familiar landscape, or the, we usually associate the word landscape with topography, with the, the physical service, surf, surface. But here we see a landscape conditioned more by digital information than, than, than by physical um, givens. What sort of architecture do we find in this landscape? Um, most of the architecture one finds is totally forgettable, sheds. Architecture which is, it serves its function and is then abandoned. Business parks, slightly upmarket sheds. Shopping centers, upmarket sheds as well. Industrial estates, even slightly more upmarket up sheds. I think the idea of the shed, next slide please. The idea of the box, the neutral box, is for us a very, I think it's on, on one hand a terrifying concept, on, on the other hand a very liberating concept. I show this slide as an example of, of I think, what is almost the ubiquitous condition in Europe. The predominant factor is, of course, mobility. One sees in the background caravans, in the back, uh, foreground delivery trucks, here um, cars. This is an, an intermediate stopping point for goods. This is, in fact, one of the warehouses of a firm, um, a, a logistics firm. We are, at the moment, designing a head or doing a competition for their headquarters. This firm used to be called a transport firm, but they've given up their transporting. They simply now do logistics, which is the administration of movement. They're planning a harbor in Genoa or a, um, a delivery network across Russia. They have one million square meters of sheds like this across Europe. I think these are phenomenal facts. They, they are located, curiously, in Münster, <laughs> but not, not in the city, at the airport. Simply connection is, is, is the important thing. How does one approach such a landscape? How does one even start to plan it? In Germany, if one even, even tries to describe it, people sh stand up in the audience and shout at you and say, criminal, how can you look at this mess? We have to, we have to, have to go back to the nice, urbane, historical city. And one walks around like this and doesn't, doesn't notice that you bought your sofa at Ikea. And um, in Holland, it's quite different. In, in Holland, the landscape, as I've said, is planned. We have worked on one or two projects here. This is. Um, a competition entry we did with the Dutch landscape office, um, Quadrat. This is part of what the Dutch call their Phoenix projects. The, in Holland, the, city, the government has decided to build one million new private or, or, or one million new homes um, in the next five years. Not distributed equally across the landscape, but, but actually reinforcing um, urban, urban, urbanized conglomerations. I think in, a, in a, an attempt to control this otherwise ramp rampant sort of development disease. This is one such area. This is an, near Utrecht. This is an, an, an area called Flirt and de Mern. Um, around here are, are, I don't know how many thousand new houses. This is a central park. So here we are actually designing landscape. But here one finds landscape is not that which surrounds, but that which is surrounded. The landscape entirely constructed. Um, some historic canals, some new, new canals, various urban in institutions such as this leaf-shaped cemetery sort of integrated in, into this new totally constructed landscape. We didn't win this competition, it was won by West 8. Next slide please. More sheds. Um, freeway in the background. Uh, this is upside down, but it doesn't matter at all. This is an another one of our, our sketches here, a computer sketch, trying, to, trying to, to measure the grain of this shed landscape. We have ourselves worked on a number of shed projects. Next slide, please. Um, for this project, we didn't design the shed. It was, it was simply an existing industrial building here. It happens to be in a city called Lemgo. No one knows where Lemgo is. One doesn't need to know where Lemgo is. It's somewhere on the European landscape. This is a lighting co company, the lighting company of, of, of Staff zum Tobel, one of the biggest lighting companies in Europe. Um, this is their production plant, and we are building here their customer centers, or display center, where they show their products. Inside an existing metal box, 
The building has absolutely no face to the outside. The customers also come from all over Germany to sort of this sort of random point on the map. They are, they're, they're doing a stuff from Tobel of doing a, building a series of showrooms, one in Vienna, right in the, in the heart of Vienna by Hans Hollein, and their German center in the, in, in the middle of the Euro, Euro Landschaft. I think very, very advanced of them to, to realize that they didn't have to be anywhere. Um, I'll explain this project in a bit more detail. I think this project is rather like a film studio or a, maybe a theater. It is a completely fabricated world inside the shed. Um, no connection at all between inside and outside. Given was the, this box, 1,000 square meters, and the subject of light. We took as our subject um, one of these light distribution diagrams. Anyone who's looked in a lighting catalog will be familiar with it. Um, it sits on a square, much like our, our, the plan form of our shed, with a, a light source here and a distribution curve here. We, we chose one purely on aesthetic grounds. It, it, it had a curve, a blob, which we liked. We inscribed the light distribution diagram on the floor of the building. Next slide, please. Um, much like one paints the lines on a, in a sports hall, so squash or, no, yeah, squash or basketball. The shed we treated like, or we, we didn't make it totally an artificial environment, we simply painted the ceiling structure black, like in a theater, so it disappears. And we added three new surfaces. The first, the floor, the light distribution diagram, so one actually walks inside the light diagram. Um, rather, it's rather like sort of, we, we, we call, or, or actually the firm called the project Built Light. The subject is not the, the light fittings themselves, but, but light, this sort of intangible thing. Light as measured on the diagram, but, or light as contained in these light boxes. These are actually um, negative boxes inside a wall. These are boxes containing different qualities of light. On our floor, we, then, we, we, we placed these light carrying walls and wrapped around the edge one, one skin, which we, we call it the second skin. It, it, it basically limits, limits the perceivable space of the interior room. And on the ceiling, things we call technical clouds, these rectangular panels of plasterboard which can take any, any, any particular light display, can be changed very rapidly. Next slide, please. One sees here the technical clouds, the second skin. Between the second skin and the existing building, we have various conference rooms or offices. Here, receptionist desk. Again, this language of sort of, of, of mass, of carved volumes. In the center of the showroom is one single volume and, and, and another blob. Um, the blob is one of our preferred forms, a sort of formless, shapeless thing. This blob is a vertical projection of the light distribution diagram, here given a, an actual material with, with these cherry wood panels, but separated from floor and ceiling by a stripe of light. Um, always light is, is, um, when, um, is, is, is the, the subject rather than the material itself. Next slide, please. One sees here the plan, the existing staircase, the shed, the second skin, the receptionist desk, office. Here are two um, workshops with ceilings which can be raised and lowered so one can simulate any, any room or any light condition. Little niches in the wall containing various light boxes. Here is a bar set into the wall, and in 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 the middle, this built light, this light dis distribution curve. This is a this is a conference room. Um, was where lighting lighting installers, lighting salesmen are trained. It has at the back a little um, translator's cabin. Often um, light. Well, customers come from Italy or from Holland or from England here to, to hear about the products of stuff and some Tobel. This is a planned diagram of the technical clouds, simply a random distribution of, of rectangles which, which are in, infinitely changeable. Next slide, please. And inside the, the, the blob, this very intimate room. Again, the, the plan diagram from outside, so sliding under the floor, the walls lifted off by l light again, also separated from the ceiling by light. The ceiling is very highly installed. We have here, I think, 15 different, different lighting modes 
the whole thing can be sort of computer controlled to, for any different lighting atmosphere. Stage at the front, chairs and at the back. This changing cabin, so peeling off the wall, um, little stairs going up into it. These walls, what can you just see here, also acoustically treated with, a, with, with perforations. Um, the lighting in the ceiling we've recessed in coffers. We had a seminar when this opened with various lighting experts and also the desi designer, Matteo Tun, who accused us of, of not respecting the lights. He, he used a word from philosophy, dinghaftekeit, which means um, thingness. He said, we have not respected the thingness of the light. We have hidden them in our ceiling. So we answered that we have respected the thingness of the false ceiling and not the light. <laughs> Very good to get philosophical about light fittings. Next slide, please. Back again to the Euro Landschaft. This theory we are, as I, I'm, I'm pushing, pushing forward here is simply a matter of necessity. We, we find ourselves um, with, with, with projects in such zones. This is, in, this is the Ruhrgebiet, the, one, the, one, the Ruhr district, the one we saw in plan form before. Um, some nature, some towns. It is the um, former, previous um, sort of industrial heartland of Germany, at the moment going through a very massive restructuring, which is called, which the um, Germans call, um, what's it called, change without growth. Basically, the former heavy industry zone is is, is meant to be, and is actually becoming the high tech zone of Germany. Basically, because, because of this curious um, network of in-place infrastructure of r railway lines and, 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 and high tension wires, which allows almost any point in the Ruhr to, to, be, to be accessed from, 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 from new technology. We've here done some projects in a, a city called Kastop Rauxel, not a particularly in, in, inspiring city. The mine, the colliery here has been closed. Um, heavily polluted site. Again, this idea that, or this one observation that reality is more fantastic than, 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 any, than any scenario. The site is heavily polluted. The top one meter from our, our particular site um, had to be cleaned. It was, it was taken away, put on trucks, sent to Holland. The Dutch washed it and sent it back 5% lighter. I think if one proposed that as a student scheme, one would say, that's absurd. You know, you're not going to send your site to Holland for washing. <laughs> it, it happened. There is, is also a rumor that the, 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 other, the, the missing 5% the Dutch sold to the English as, as landfill. <laughs> Very unfair. Another one of our sketches, this again, this sort of syntax of, of large, obje large objects, icebergs, um, abandoned ground, etc., etc. Next two slides, please. Working in such sites, one is not working with large cultural buildings like the Luxor Theatre. These are really bottom line buildings with, one must say, the worst possible developers. This is a building with a developer who I think I would like to name him. <laughs> I think he should be shot. <laughs> Um, a building with an ab absolute minimum budget. The developer is, is doing a building to then to rent to a government institution. It is in fact a medical insurance building for retired coal miners. Um, the rent level was fixed, or is, is, is fixed even before we had the job. Um, the, whole, the, the developer simply wants to save as much money as possible because he's, he's, he's going to get his rent. Um, he, he doesn't care if the, if the building is efficiently planned, because if you plan it badly, he has more square meters and he gets his, his rent from that as well. A, an absolute rat bag of a developer. He said, you can only have one window type. That, that's all I'm paying for. So we sort of said, well, should we do this? We went back to the drawing boards. And then we said, could we turn the window on its side once or twice? And he said, if it doesn't cost any more. <laughs> so this is a, a box, the, the cheapest possible building with every second window turned side, which develops of this very interesting weave. Um, those of you who know, know the theory of Gottfried Semper will re recall that Semper traces back the origins of architecture to handcraft, to weaving. I think this is very much in the German Semper-esque tradition, the woven facade. Um, our w woven windows 
they don't actually start anywhere. They, they go around the building non-stop and sort of arrive back where they started. This is the front, this is the back. The building is, is simply a box. The program on the ground floor was, was bigger, so the, it got an extension. Push it out a bit. We were able to make actually an indent here as well because, because he, the developer didn't want the entrance hall to be too big. And we actually did manage to get one double height space. I think here the, the game is actually to, 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 to play the rules but also to undermine them so f from within. I think one should, architecture cannot stay on its high pedestal. You simply have to get in there, roll your sleeves up and sort of get your hands dirty. Um, the, almost the, the, the second, we have two ideas in this building. One is the window, the second is the house number. It's, it turned out the house number was what upset the local residents the most. Um, we, one obviously recognizes the sort of, the, the sort of super graphics which traces back, I think perhaps to maybe even to early Venturi buildings, the sort of thing which Moisson has analyzed very delicately. Um, I myself like very much this idea of writing on a building, but the writing itself has absolutely no content. It is simply an empty sign. A four is a four, or the K on, on the kindergarten is, is just a K. It is the thing itself, but writ big. Here, our house number could not be writ any bigger. Behind this building, we've done a second building. The two form a sort of an ensemble, the sort of first pioneer steps onto this new new um, industrial park. The second building was a slightly better program, better client. Next slide, please. One sees here the, the colliery tower is, is sort of stands now in the, in the middle as a sort of remnant of what was once there. Our window building here, one sees it there in the background. And a second building here. This is a, this is a sort of not, not a commercial building, this is a sort of semi semi-government institution building. There are actually two institutions in it. One is a retra retraining center for unemployed women. This is an area of enormously high unemployment and particularly amongst women. So here one has a, sp a particular or a special center where w women can learn computer skills or n new jobs. Simply a very socially connected program. And the lower two floors are um, an outpost of the local open university, a university which has no particular campus. It's a campus is, is everywhere, but sometimes people have to come for seminars. So um, uh, we have, I'll show, I'll show later on another slide, we have the top half women's retraining, lower half open u university, and then a whole range of seminar rooms. Next slide, please. One sees here the two buildings. The, um, it's called the Knappschaft, this um, miners, miners Medical Insurance, and the um, Education Building, and the Coal Tower in the background. Um, this is here, what we have it at, at the back of the Education Building a conference hall, which sort of stands almost like a sort of a landed spaceship. It's a, a, again one of, our, one of our mass buildings, our icebergs. Um, more obvious when one sees the plan. Next slide, please. Again, uh, here, fairly tough language. It is, it is, it is, this is a very tough industrial landscape, very sort of simple brick buildings. Here we use black and white buildings, or um, white bricks, to, um, I think, almost, almost contradict the volume, volume of the building. This is our lecture hall at the back, which cantilevers quite sort of manically, I think, eight or ten meters at one end. Next slide, please. The front of this building, this is here, entrance, is connected by a bridge to a shopping center in the inner city. So the people are meant also, also to actually walk from the inner city to, to this new zone. I think it is not in, this, is, this is not an entirely disconnected landscape. Not, these are not entirely autonomous objects. But still, these are more like frontier posts, looking, at, looking out of this yet-to-be-built um, industrial estate or business park. The front of the building, I think, again, this, I wouldn't call it architecture parlant, but the facade, almost as text, one can actually find an F in the window here, as we had the K in our kindergarten. F for Fraun, for the Women's University, or for Fan, which is Fan University, which means open university. Um, um, 
the plan is important. The plan is basically we have an, an anchor structure here, a box, and then a, almost a, a sort of a, a lean-to, uh, an, an, an element glued on the side but twisted. This is this piece coming forward, and the lecture hall at the back, which is only at first floor level, so sort of sitting on a, on a narrower base. Very, very prosaic um, geometry, simply boxes with, with corners cut off where they need to be cut off. Once at the entrance here, we have a, a double height space to give some, um, uh, some greater degree of, sort of event as, as one enters. Curiously, we have uh, two entrances, one at ground level, one at first floor level from this connecting bridge. Next slide, please. Again, like our bridge watcher's house, this building is either, or depending on how one, what one, one sees it, how one stands in relationship to it, it is either very formal, very static, or if you stand in the corner, very dynamic, sort of corners sort of flying out beyond the building itself. This is the connecting bridge with a very curious sort of salami structure. The internal geometry is almost, reflects almost in, in exactly this, this um, syntax of the outside these sort of simple folded walls, um, very low budget again, so we simply use color to, to give a further articulation to the inside. I think with all of our buildings, there's something we, we said about our library in Munster, we use a very limited range of materials, um, white plaster walls, um, steel handrails. The handrails, the steel work is always very important in our buildings. This is something one can do with a bit more detail. It's the part of the building one touches. Um, and a good, uh, a good floor surface is always important, wood or stone, something which really has a, a dignity. Next slide, please. Here one sees the entrance hall, the stone surface, a green terrazzo, folded up the wall to almost carpet-like. Um, again, text and building. This, is, this building is called Dietze. Dietze is short for Dienstleistungszentrum, which simply means sort of business building. It's a sort of non-word. It's, it, it's almost content-less. This is our entrance, um, fire escape stair, en lower entrance, upper entrance um, across a bridge. For us, it is simply a question of actually of almost doing less, but doing each piece very carefully. One column left in exposed concrete always means a big argument with the client, and they'll probably paint it later. Um, one wooden bench and the terrazzo floor. Next slide, please. The conference room at the back, so one sees sitting on a base and then cantilevering out eight meters. This is inside the conference room. It has one wide low end, one high narrow end, and the ceiling almost like the underbelly of a zeppelin. This is a very wide span conference room. Um, a wall here hiding, hiding again a translator's cabin and chair storage. This this large window, the high window, this one here, is only three, 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 three meters from, from the connecting bridge, so almost like a television screen. As one walks past it, one looks in into the conference room to, and, and sees what's happening. It's sort of opening the inner function out to the city. Next slide, please. We were asked by our client during the design to do a beautiful computer rendering of how the building will look. He, he didn't believe our line drawings. We almost, we, 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 we do very few computer simulated drawings of our buildings. We, we try to draw, to, to actually to draw as little as possible. Simply, simply the, the bare facts. There's a whole syndrome, I think, of seduction, of, of image seduction, not only um, in, in the world of theory, but also in the world of, world of um, development. Clients love these images. There's also a syndrome of, uh, amongst clients of, of um, disappointment. When they see the building, they say, but, but the computer image was so much better. <laughs> I think our client paid for some renderer to make this image of our building, which we never don't like at all. For us, even the fire escape stair at the back is 10 times more interesting, 10 times more inspiring in terms of space, in terms of light, in terms of the fact that one can walk through it, one can touch the handrail, than this very expensive simulation. And for us, I think, Architecture is about mass and not about illusion. Next slide, please. Architecture is also about violence. This is one of our building sites in Holland. The last project I, I want to show is maybe a, one which 
contains lots of the themes I have been elucidating, or hope, I hope I've elucidated them. This is again a fairly pragmatic project, a, an inner city redevelopment area in Hengelo. Hengelo is a small city on the German border. Hengelo was bombed in the war, almost completely destroyed, a former in industrial city, um, reconstructed with a, moder a modernist plan after the war, grid system. Very, uh, uh, I think only one or two sto f f story buildings. It is now, as mo most du Dutch cities, reinventing itself, taking part in this, I think, competition through architecture. Um, the image of a city in, 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 in Holland is something which all the residents take very seriously. They, they, they all go to Groningen to see the museum or, or to um, Tilburg to see the new concert hall from, from Joe Conan. This, these are, this is the sort of a means of public representation or a means of, of, of self-representation. I think a very important role of architecture. I think Holland is a very good example which should be um, more spoken about. Here in Hengelo, the city is building a new theatre, but also a new shopping centre. The shopping centre, or our, we, we won a competition here, I think basically because of our pragmatism. We, we had the biggest car park, 400 cars underground. I hope we had the best urbanism as well. Um, this is the market square, the centre of the city, town hall with a, an Italianate campanile. Here's the station. One sees the whole pattern of the city station in a city town hall. Here, a corner to be reinvented. There's a new, new in piece of infrastructure, a ring road being built around here. Here, we have to somehow weave together all these fragments, a 1960s office building. This is a department store from us, um, a shed building, but this time an inner city shed building. This is a shopping center with, um, yeah, with, with shops. Shops basically only work on, on one floor. They're very low density. It's shops with housing on top. We concentrated the housing at the two ends to give the building a, a significant urban presence. We basically treated it like the pancake it is and, pu and put these um, towers on either end. <coughs> Very important is this pin here. This is um, almost like the, the next generation from our electronic number tower in Rotterdam. This is a, an electronic campanile. It's, it's simply a, a tower with, with an, an electronic clock at the top. But very important because it's a, um, a hinge, a pin between the, the existing market square and this new, much smaller square um, on the other side. Um, this composition of squares, the double squares, is sort of, if one really goes back to contextualist, contextualist analogy, is like St. Mark's in Venice, the double square hinged with a, with a, with a tower be, um, shared between them. This project is under construction. As you can see, this is the start of construction. Architecture is not always without shock. Next slide, please. These are, these are from our competition drawings. Market Square Station, a shopping passage be between with, with um, a 100 meter long in inflatable cigar shaped roof. These have all survived to the, to the scheme which is being now built. So one story shopping, concentrated housing. The form has changed slightly, but I think the, the composition of passage, low building, um, department store, shed and tower is, is, has, has remained intact. Next slide, please. This is a sketch from the competition, the electronic campanile, and the campanile are very difficult to see. These are this is the, some of our um, detailed drawings. It is um, a 45 meter high tower with um, LED number displays on, uh, it, it's actually upside down, sorry. Number displays on the top. And the bottom is a, um, now a glass box, frameless glass box um, with, um, one does, one does, it's translucent glass. So at nighttime, the, the mass of the tower will appear to be to be standing on, standing on light. Clock in Dutch is a wonderful word, clock. Um, relates perhaps back to the K on our kindergarten. K is a letter we seem to find ourselves returning to. This is the clock tower. Next slide, please. Um, this is, the, all these different buildings are in fact one building underground. Here, a, a 400 car car park. Um, here, again, this idea of, of, of text, of, of surface writing. Basically, 
the structural grid of 7.8 meters, is it 7.8? Is is a, a given? It's all, all it, it, it's all very um, logical um, precast concrete construction system. Here, simply the necessary bay numbers on the columns and markings of parking bays. We are hoping to develop into a whole sort of underground landscape. Next slide, please. Above ground, the Campanile again, and next to it, this department store shed. The theme here is this large roof. Th this is also in um, corrugated metal, the sort of shed one expects to find on the periphery or in the Euro Landschaft, but here actually transplanted to the center of the city. I think this idea that if city is a condition one finds everywhere, the objects from outside the city are also found within the city. Here we have a big roof, three floors at this side, two floors at this side, um, different shops inside. Basically, ar the architecture here is simply a, a half a meter deep, deep um, layer around the outside. The whole inside is commercial space designed by others. Next slide, please. And finally, well, this is the, the shopping, the back, the back of the shopping with, with housing on top. Here again, one finds this um, syntax of mass. These buildings looking as if they're carved from a, from a single material. Here we have um, five, five floors of, ho of housing, well, actually both sides, five floors of housing on top of the shopping. One sees here, of course, the relationship to the bridge watcher's house, this idea of, of the single unambiguous object. Um, perhaps to, to end a final quote from, from our text. At the level of detail and on the level of phenomenological experience, the perseverance of mass, the haptic quality of material surface, is today a necessary counterpoint to the dematerialized projections of cinema, video, and media. It is now more consequent for architecture to stay, not to chase the chimeral electronic shadows, but to insist on the, the necessity and the clarity of its mass. Thank you. windows if you're near those windows those people who have to leave could maybe leave very quickly and then we could have a few minutes of questions I've taken to reading I, I can't re 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 remember what I have to say otherwise Maybe uh, 